Hello, welcome to lecture five. This will be the last lecture in the first half of the course. Okay, so uh, as I've already explained, the sixth meeting is a revision meeting, which will take place live, hopefully, if the technology works, uh, or if I can work the technology, perhaps. And so it will be a meeting where we'll go through what we've done in the first five lectures. And the idea is that it's live so that you can ask questions uh, and ask me to, to just repeat anything, explain anything that's not clear. OK, which is why it's important that you look at the first five lectures first. Obviously, if you're looking at this one, then probably you you're doing that. So that's OK. The first half of the course, as I've already mentioned, is the more difficult half of the course. And um, therefore, it's very important that we do this revision and make sure that you understand what's going on. And it's also the case that without understanding the first half of the course, you don't you won't understand the second half of the course, even though it's it's much simpler. Uh, it introduces f far fewer new ideas and new difficult things. Um, but you do need to understand the things from the first half. OK, so we do the first half. We have a revision. We make sure we understand. And there is a little a little test on the website already, which you can look at. Uh, and then we move on to the second half of the course um, after Easter, which will be easier. And then once we get after Easter, we'll have to start thinking about what we're going to do about uh, the exam and about final assessment for the course. But that's something something for the future. I can't answer any questions on that at the moment because nobody has any idea. OK, so in lecture five, what we're going to be talking about is more complicated sentence structures. OK, so there are two types. We've got compound and complex sentences. OK. Before I go on to, to that topic, let me just reiterate something um, as a result of, of questions that I've had from some of you. Um, maybe I didn't make it properly clear. Uh, when we were talking last time about different types of objects, um, there was some, some question over prepositional objects. And the point about a prepositional object is that when you have this, what, what looks like a prepositional phrase coming after a verb, if the preposition is essential to the verb, if it's, if it's brought about by the verb itself, and then it's followed by a noun, then it's going to be a, prep, a prepositional object. If it's not, if it's simply a prepositional phrase describing how the verb is done, uh, then it's just a preposition. So if you have a verb like sleep and you say he slept in the garden, okay, then clearly sleep is the verb, not, not sleep in, right? So you could just say he slept or you can say where he slept and then you say he slept in the garden, okay? But when we have example like look after the baby, okay, it's not that you look and the way you look is after the baby, it's you look after the baby. So the baby is the uh, object of this whole verb construction, look after, but it happens to be a, a verb, verbal construction which requires that there is a preposition after which comes before the object. So it's known as a prepositional object. Normally, I, I don't focus too much on this, partly because it's, it's really not that important in terms of if you think of... Um, this type of verb structure that look after, if we just think of that as the verb, uh, which happens to be made up of two parts, rather than the verb being look and then after being preposition, um, th then it doesn't make any difference. So you've got look after as the verb and you can simply say, well, the baby is the direct object of the verb. It's simply that we talk about this type of direct object uh, as being a prepositional object because this preposition is essential to introduce this object. It's not describing how the verb is done. It's actually, it's, it's essential to, to finish off the verb. But generally speaking, we're not going to worry too much about that. If, if you have any more questions, let me know. But uh, I, I don't think, it, it's, not, it's not, not such a big deal. Okay. All right, so today we're going to talk about compound and complex sentences. Okay. 
Particularly, we're going to talk about complex sentences. Compound sentences are, are, are basically fairly simple. So they're fairly simple, but they're not simple sentences. Okay, so in the simple sentence, right, we have these various parts which we talked about. And each part was played by a phrase. Um, in compound and complex sentences, okay, it's, it's a little different. So first of all, in compound sentences, we've got two separate clauses, uh, which or, or more, which are of, we say, of equal weight, of equal value. The, the relationship between them, we say, is a, is a relationship of coordination, okay? So I say something like, I went to work and you stayed in bed, okay? These are two separate clauses, which could be, of course, separate sentences, right? You could say, I went, I, I went to work, full stop. You went to bed, full stop. I put an and in here because, in my opinion, these two uh, clauses, which could be separate sentences, they are somehow connected as one idea or one, one thought, right? So I normally, when, I, when I'm teaching writing, I say to people that one sentence is one thought. One paragraph is one idea made up of a number of thoughts which are connected. So the fact that I go to work and you stay in bed, this is, uh, this is one thought that I have. But these two parts to this thought are equal. They don't rely on each other. Okay. So the two halves are both fine as complete sentences on their own. Okay. So there's really not much more to say about that. There are a few um, words that we can use to connect, right? Words like and or or, um, or, or words which have words or phrases which have similar meaning. Um, and so the, basically, we can we treat them as as we, um, as two individual sentences which happen to be stuck together, right? There isn't really much else to say about them. What's much more interesting and much more complicated, naturally, uh, this is complex sentences. So in complex sentences, one of the, uh, so, so the, the values are not the same, right? The value in, in so the, the weight, the importance, these are not the same. One of the clauses is subordinate to the other, okay? So generally speaking, what this means is that the, there, is a, there is a main clause and there is a subordinate clause. The subordinate clause will often be a complete sentence on its own, or it could be a complete sentence on its own, whereas the main clause is somehow missing something. And that something that is missing is provided by the subordinate clause. Okay. So what this means is that the subordinate clause is playing a role in the main clause. The subordinate clause might be any of the parts of a sentence which we've already discussed. So the subordinate clause could be the subject of the main clause, or it could be the object, or it could be a complement. Okay. So that's why it's, it's absolutely essential that we understand the parts of a simple sentence, because when we look at complex sentences, we're looking at a whole clause being one part of that sentence. Okay. That will be much simpler when we when we look at examples. Um, there are various types of clauses, okay, um, which I don't want you to kind of learn a list, right? So, so in the notes that I put up last week, that there are uh, there are kind of lists of these things, which I, I don't need you to learn that like by heart and remember everything. It's just there as a sort of extra explanation if, if you need it. Okay. So one of the types uh, of clause which we come across very often is the non-finite clause. So this is a clause with a verb, but the verb is non-finite. Okay. So non-finite means, as I think I mentioned last time, that there is no personal ending. Okay, no person is given and there's no personal ending. And of course, in English, that only means no S if it's present in present tense, because you know, otherwise we don't have personal endings. And there's no time ending, which again means that there's no ED, basically. 
Um, uh, although, okay, when I say there's no ED, you can also use, of course, the past participles uh, as non-finite clauses, right? So, but, but they don't refer to the past, okay? So, <laughs> this is, it's quite difficult to explain without actually looking at examples, so it's going to be easier when we go through the, um, through the exercises, okay? So there are these different types of clauses. There are also things called verbless clauses. Um, but what we want to concentrate on are a couple of, couple of issues. So we need to concentrate on working out which, uh, working out, first of all, when there is a complex sentence, okay? So when there is a complex sentence, as I said, that there is um, a process of subordination. So one, you have the main clause and you have a subordinate clause. Now, particularly when those two, uh, when the subordinate clause is a, a clause which could stand on its own, so it, it appears to be a, a whole sentence on its own, then it's usually introduced with a subordinator. Okay? So a subordinator can be a word like, like because. Right? Um, and which, which introduces a relationship between the two parts, right? Now, the problem is that many subordinators are also uh, prepositions. So it's very important for us to be able to recognize which are which, okay? But as you know, prepositions are used to, drink, to, to link uh, noun phrases to the rest of the sentence, whereas subordinators will be used to introduce whole clauses and link it to the rest of the sentence. So the easiest way to, to determine this is whether there is another verb after the subordinator uh, or whether there's only one verb in the whole thing. As I said, th there are different types of clauses, but the ones which are introduced with subordinators are, are generally ones which will also have a verb in. Okay, So that, that's the first exercise that we've got coming up. The second, I think it's the second exercise, I will just check that it's the second exercise, um, that we need to look at is the one where, yeah, so we look at the functions. So the functions in a complex sentence, uh, in a complex sentence are exactly the same as in a simple sentence. The point is that instead of having uh, one simple noun phrase as, uh, as a subject, sometimes we have a, a, a whole clause which looks like a, a sentence on its own as the subject, okay? So in order to, to say what role, what function in the sentence the subordinate clause has, okay? Obviously, the first thing you have to do is work out which clause is the subordinate clause, okay? So in this sort of examples we're going to look at, that will be the one, that the, the main clause will be the one which needs something from the other clause. The clause which appears to be complete, that will be the subordinate clause because it doesn't have anything else playing a role within it, okay? It doesn't need anything else. So you need to look at the, at the verbs in the sentence and work out which one is the main verb, which one is the, the main verb about which, which really governs this whole sentence, okay? And then you'll see which is the subordinate clause, so it's not that one, right? Once you've worked out which is the subordinate clause, then, and only then, you can work out what role that subordinate clause is playing in the overall sentence, okay? So as I said, it might be a subject, it might be an object, it might be a complement. Um, it also could be something which we call an appositive, okay? Appositives are actually the easiest ones to identify. Uh, an appositive clause is a clause which it, it doesn't actually play a significant role and you could remove it from the sentence. Uh, what it does is it's a clause which restates something within the sentence, okay? Uh, and very often these uh, clauses are verbless, okay? So you get a, a repetition of something which has already been stated, okay? So you say something like, Dr. Hinton, comma, my favorite teacher, comma, puts his lectures online, 
Okay, and then this this bit in the middle, my favorite teacher. This is an appositive clause, right? It's simply a, a repetition of Dr. Hint, telling us more about him. So instead of saying um, somebody who is something something, we can just use an appositive in this way to to give more information, right? So sometimes it's useful information. Sometimes sometimes it's just an additional remark and it's not very important. Um, sometimes it's, it, it's essential information. So it's, it's part of the sentence, but you could remove it and the sentence would still make sense. Okay, so these are actually very easy to identify. They're, they're basically, they're, they will be in commas um, and, and they don't appear to play a role, but they're still there. Uh, okay, so all of the, the types of function which we saw um, it could be direct objects, indirect objects, and so on. All of those types of functions, which which we saw in simple sentences, can be can also exist in in complex sentences. The point being that it's a clause, not a simple phrase, which plays that role. Okay. Uh, so those are those. Yeah. All okay. right. I'm just checking what what exercises we have to come. So th those are the two. The first two exercises. The third and fourth exercises are connected with. Um, nominal clauses, okay. A nominal clause is a clause which plays the role of a of a noun, right? So it would normally be a noun in a sentence. You, you could have a single noun, and uh, these are nominal clauses. So they generally they'll be playing the parts of objects and subjects, but we'll see that they can be some other things as well. Sometimes these can be uh, confusing because they often involve different forms of the verb, so you think that it's a verbal clause, uh, but actually it's playing a nominal role in the sentence. So again, what's important is, just like with parts of speech, it's, it's not about kind of knowing what something is and then being able to, to just say, oh yes, I know this, I, I know what this is. It's about looking at a sentence and seeing what role is being played in the sentence by this particular thing, okay? So you can have various roles played by clauses with two infinitives, right? Or with ing forms. Um, they can play various roles. So you can't say, oh, there's an ing form, so it must be this, or it must be that. So the only way you can work it out is by getting a grip in on the sentence and saying, okay, I know that this is the main verb, right? The main verb, which is governing the main clause. And then I look at what other things are going on what other things this verb needs. Does this verb need objects? Does this verb come with complements? Okay, is there a subject for this verb? And that's what I've got to find amongst the other clauses, okay? So, although this is a kind of, it's, it's a sort of technical thing when we talk about complex sentences, in fact, uh, we can only really examine this by looking at, uh, at a lot of examples because it's only by looking at examples that you can actually see what, what I mean when I say the main, uh, the main clause, okay? Okay, there is, uh, in the notes that I put up, um, there's a lot more information about different types of clauses, okay, uh, which can feature. I want to focus on these clauses which have subordinators because it's important that you can recognize the difference between a subordinator and a preposition when they appear to be, that's the same word, basically. And on spotting the, the function uh, within the sentence. So rather than classification of clauses, which is a, a technical thing, which is not that important, I think, uh, I'd rather that you are able to analyze the sentence. That, that's what it comes down to, right? So just as we analyze sentences for parts of speech, we now analyze sentences for functions. That was easier with simple sentences. Now we're going to do it with more complex sentences where simply the, the, the part of the sentence which has that function is, is often going to be longer. It's often going to contain a verb on its own, but there are verbless clauses as well, as we'll see. So we, we can't just only look for verbs, although they are often the, the most interesting and important examples, okay? Okay, so I think that we're going to finish there, uh, and I will now move on to uh, to looking at the answers 
to the exercises and this will take some time I'll, I'll go through I'll try and go through as carefully as possible and explain each one separately so if there is anything which uh, you would like me to explain more or explain again uh, or which I haven't explained at all okay please let me know within the next week all right and then next week at the time when we should normally have our class okay we will try to connect uh, live on YouTube and uh, I will take some kind of uh, register to check who is there okay so uh, if there is any uh, problem with being present at that time present present um, please let me know okay I do understand that you know, we are living in difficult times and people have various uh, problems with uh, with connecting in, in different ways so I'll be understanding um, but I'm not going to be understanding if you contact me at the end of the year and say sorry I haven't done anything because I was busy you need to, to let me know now okay it's very important as I said that you understand what's happened in the first five lectures because otherwise the second half of the course isn't going to mean very much to you and it's very important that you you work systematically with this because it's a lot to try to learn at the end we don't know what will happen at the end whether we're going to have a normal exam or some other form of assessment we'll see uh, but please don't try to leave everything to the last minute uh, or hope that that maybe there'll be no assessment this year uh, it's important that you keep up with it okay all right so please send in questions um, and uh, you can put, as I said, you can put comments on the videos or you can just write to me. Uh, but if you have a, an individual question, probably best just to write to me. Remember to have a look at the test, which is on the on the website, which I expect everybody to do at some point. OK, the, the, there's no deadline for it, but I expect it to be done at some point. Uh, and after this lecture, there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. It would be better if you did it before the revision lesson next week, uh, simply because it will it will show you. Uh, what you don't know, uh, and then you will know what to ask about. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to finish there, and I'll move on to going through the exercises in a moment. Okay. Thank you.